before a tornado destroyed this tower. So that tower is gone. It's been replaced. This is a 200 foot tower. That's a 9L 6 meter Yagi at 50 feet. So this is a quadcopter that's taking these videos. And there's another 9L 6 meter Yagi at 100 feet. Actually, it's about 80 feet. And that's not the end of it. There's another 9L 6 meter Yagi here at about 110 feet. This is all just a crumpled pile of junk metal right now. <laughs> So this is my favorite six meter antenna, but let me emphasize, you do not need anything like this in order to really enjoy the bin. My uh, neighbor W3UR has a seven element Yagi, which is about 28 feet long, I guess, and it works every bit as well as this, but I like experimenting with antennas and that's why I have one that's unusually large. Don't worry about that, you don't need it. So, for anyone interested in antennas, you really must own the AWRL Antenna Handbook. And the AWRL has been putting a big effort into updating its publications in a significant way in recent years. So a new version of the antenna book, I think, is due to come out in a year or two, being actively worked on now. So this is something if you don't have on your bookshelf, you should. And if you've got the an old version on your shelf, it's worthwhile investing in a new one. Give yourself a gift. So this is the most important slide in the entire presentation. Now, a lot of us are active on HF and we think we know a lot about propagation, but let me tell you right here that everything you know about propagation based on your knowledge and experience on HF is totally unrelated to what we experience on six meters. And I'll explain why that's true, but it's there's no relationship. And there's little relationship between sporadic E on the HF bands, and we experience that on 10 and 12 and 15 meters. There's little relationship between that and six meters also. So this presentation uh, focuses exclusively on Northern Hemisphere, mid-latitude sporadic E. There are other forms of sporadic E. There's auroral sporadic E. There's equatorial sporadic E. We're not going to talk about those. I've only got a short period of time. Although Ed reminded me that this recording can go on for four hours, but we're not going to do that. So we're going to focus on Northern Hemisphere's mid-latitude sporadic E. Southern Hemisphere, believe it or not, is a little bit different. And the reason for that is because there's a lot less land mass in the Southern Hemisphere. And that affects six meter propagation in a significant way, believe it or not. Just one thing about my presentation style, there's a lot more information on the slides then I will attempt to cover. I'll cover the high points in my comments. Slides are, are available to you, so you can look at the slides afterwards. And if you have any questions, you can always contact me at my email address, which is on the first slide of this uh, presentation. And it's never changed. So it's, on, it's been on qrz.com for many, many years. And you can contact me that way, and I'll be happy to address any questions that might come up after today. So this is kind of the context of, uh, of what we do on six meters in June and July. We're right in the middle of six meters sporadic E season. And my primary interest on six meters is long distance propagation, transatlantic, transpacific. And believe it or not, it's, it's not that difficult to walk into Japan on six meters via sporadic E. There was a very excellent night on six meters late afternoon or early evening on six meters about two weeks ago. And I worked 40 Japanese station that evening. And six meters was very, very good to Europe uh, earlier in that day. And I worked more than a hundred European stations on that same day. So six meters goes from really, really good to really, really bad. And today, and today was uh, not an especially good day. Yesterday was quite good but today, not so much. So there's this tremendous amount of variability. So what's going on here? You know, you, you talk to most hams about six meters and they think, oh yeah, you work the local guys. And, and then in uh, June and July, you get to work the guys in Florida and maybe Cuba. And you know, what's so exciting about that? Well, it's a lot more than that. Well, the, the sporadic E propagation not only reflects from a single individual sporadic E patch, I'll describe what, the term patch means in a moment, but it also uh, 
reflects off multiples so that the signal can propagate to distances of six, 7,000 miles and more. I mentioned I worked uh, 40 Japanese stations about two weeks ago. I also worked a station in Kazakhstan about 200 miles from the Chinese border. It's called magic band for a reason. Uh, incredible things happen when you least expect it. What goes on here, you know, most of us, uh, when we get on six meters for the first time, you know, we hear these stations in Florida and maybe Cuba. But what happens to our signals if they don't reflect all the way to the ground? Well, of course, with a little bit higher angle, they, they just miss the ground and propagate beyond the earth. And you might think, well, that probably causes them to propagate out of the space. If our signals propagate at an even higher angle, they may very well propagate it into outer space. But there's also a very good chance in June and July that they will, in fact, reflect to another sporadic E patch looking like this. So, so I remember when I first got on six meters many, many years ago, I got used to working stations in Florida, Georgia, and then noticed a few days when the band would open to California. And, you know, what's that all about? Well, it's probably a pretty simple mode of propagation where it propagates uh, up to the ionosphere, back down about halfway to California, that's somewhere in the plains, and then back to another sporadic E patch, and then finally lands in California. And, you know, you think, well, that's great, but what about something more interesting than work in California? Well, there's so much six meter activity now, it, more six meter activity than there ever has been because of the popularity of the FT8 mode that we're discovering propagation that we never knew about before, just because the activity level is so incredibly great. So let me just describe these sporadic key patches just for a moment. On six meters, we are operating very close to the MUF, the maximum usable frequency of sporadic key. There are maybe one or two occasions a year where the MUF goes high enough so you can operate uh, sporadic key on two meters, but those are very rare. But on six meters, sporadic key propagation occurs essentially every day in June and July. Now, that doesn't mean we can communicate over very long distances every day, but there's some sort of sporadic key there every day, and it's not unusual for us to be able to work very long distances. And these uh, sporadic key patches are really not like clouds because their, their thickness is uh, not very great compared to their width and length. So a, a typical sporadic key ionized patch is about 500 kilometers in east-west length. So that's about 300 miles more or less, but usually much less. And they're about 50 kilometers north-south width, but usually much less. So that's uh, something like 10 or 20 miles. So very common for someone up around New York City to be working contacts via sporadic E, and then another station down in Philadelphia can't hear any of it because these patches are small very small compared to what we used to on HF. Now on HF, we're used to finding the band open, PX signals on the band, and we can hear people all over the United States are working this propagation, but sporadic E is very limited geographic extent. So this is the kind of propagation I enjoy working. Uh, mo most of my operating on six meters tries to focus on working transatlantic into Europe or further beyond to, uh, let's say, Israel or into the Persian Gulf, maybe occasionally as far as Kazakhstan, if things are just right, that's about 6,500 miles, or Trans-Pacific. And we had a very, very exceptional Trans-Pacific opening about 10 or 12 days ago. And on that day, I uh, worked a station in China. I also worked a station in two stations in Korea. And my neighbor at W3UR worked a station in Taiwan. This is uh, just the kind of magic that happens on six. And it's caused by very intense sporadic E generation of these patches. And there are some days when there are many, many of these irregularly shaped sporadic E patches. And there are some days when there are very few. And that was that day when we had such an incredible experience into Far East was an exceptional day of sporadic E. So remember I showed that slide up front to, to kind of lay the groundwork, and that is sporadic E propagation on six meters bears no resemblance whatsoever 
to the propagation we know and love on HF. No relationship. First of all, it has almost nothing to do with the sun. So when you think about, well, we're in this new solar cycle, solar cycle 25, so six meters must be getting a lot better. Well, in one respect it is, and that is that there's a form of propagation, which I will not discuss tonight, called trans-equatorial propagation. And that was very, very active in April and May, and even during the first few days of June. And it was possible to work easily from the Northeast and United States into Argentina and Chile, the southern part of Brazil. And that was using a mode of propagation called TEP. And that has been very, very enhanced by solar cycle 25. It's just remarkable how enhanced it is. But we're out of the TEP season now, and we are in the middle of the sporadic E season on six meters. And it's, it, it should continue to be very, very good right through just about the end of July. So what causes this kind of ionization? Well, the ions are derived from dust-like meteoroids. Absolutely have not, having nothing to do with the kind of ionization we experience it with the F region on HF. The, the, our experience on HF with normal F region DX propagation is caused by solar ionizing radiation that ionizes mostly oxygen molecules in the atmosphere. That has nothing to do with sporadic E. Sporadic E is caused by high temperature ablation. Ablation is a fancy word that kind of means vaporization. Tons and tons of dust-like metallic meteoroids, about 100 tons per day of this dust-like material comes into the earth. So it gets heated up tremendously, and that's what causes the ionization. But that's not enough, because that wouldn't create that much variability day to day. The other thing that happens is related to weather and climate. At very high altitudes, about 100 kilometers or so, so that's 60, 70 mile altitude above the Earth, right at the edge of space, about the same uh, altitude that the space station is at. That's an area where there are atmospheric winds. And those atmospheric winds, are, they have a fancy name called zonal winds. And what that means is that these winds blow parallel to the equator. So they're very, very close to exactly east-west. And there's a set of winds, or there are some winds that blow at an altitude of about 70 miles. And there's an opposing wind about 10 kilometers or about 6 to 10 miles above that in the opposite direction. So they're blowing westerly. And what that causes, these winds that occur in June and July at very high altitudes, is it causes wind shears in the area between these two wind areas. And that's where the sporadic E patches are formed. But even that's not enough. In order to get the really high MUFs that we need for six meters, we also need some of the effects from lower in the atmosphere to further compress these patches and make their density even greater. And some of the kinds of things that happen in the atmosphere that cause these patches to get denser and denser and allow us to work six meter DX, include things like uh, tidal winds, actually caused by the moon, causes the tides, just like it does in the ocean. Also, our planetary waves, which are related to the continents and uh, gravity waves and a whole bunch of other things. So some people even think lightning storms and other things are, are related to causing these disturbances in the atmosphere, which then cause these sporadic heat patches to get more and more and more dense, which is what we really want to see happen on six meters. So the only thing that I've talked about here that has any relationship at all to the sun is related to the weather in the atmosphere. It has nothing to do with ionization at all. It has to do with compressing these electrons that give us our fun experiences on six meters. So let's look at a couple of measurements of this kind of activity just to show what goes on here. This, these are actual measurements of sporadic E activity taken by an observatory in Northern Europe. And what, what's, what's this busy, busy chart trying to tell us? So 
On the vertical side of this chart is altitude above the earth, 95 to 115 kilometers. That's about 60 to 70 miles. And then, of course, the bottom is time from midnight on the left side and then noon in the middle of this of this chart and then midnight again on the right side. So let's let's just take a look at that really bright cloud there right in the middle. And and let me point out first of all that what this chart is showing is not ionization intensity. It's not that. It's a current rate. So in other words, how often when you turn your 6 meter radio on how often can you expect to experience six meter propagation at various times of the day? So what this is telling you is that if we go across the chart starting from the left, sporadic E propagation can begin as early as dawn, but the occurrence rate is low. And then it picks up significantly at about 7 a.m. and even more so at 9 a.m. And then it slowly starts to decline after noon. So if you don't have a lot of time to get on six meters, the best time to turn your radio on and see what's happening is in the morning between 7 a.m. and noon. Or if you have less time than that, then maybe from 9 a.m. till noon. That's the very best time. But then there's another period in the evening where propagation picks up again. That's roughly from 5 p.m. until midnight. And occasionally, but low probability, occasionally even later. And there was one night about three weeks ago when six meters was still, still solidly open to California at 2 a.m. when I went to bed. So it was still, still open, but that's a very rare thing, probably one night per summer. So this is the actual occurrence, actually measured. This is not forecasted, this is real measurements. And the time here that's shown is the time at the location of the ionization patch. So if you're working really, really long distances on six meters, our local patch that we get into will be pretty much the same time that's shown in here. But if we're, if we're communicating with a ham in Israel, let's say, it's gonna be much later in the day in Israel. So he'll be, uh, have a different probability. You know, he'll, he'll be about uh, seven hours ahead of us. So it'll be at a different point in this occurrence rate uh, chart. 